Well, howdy folks, welcome back to Ecline Class Live from the Woods. Uh, I'm gonna skip over, uh, we're gonna skip over the uh, chapter that is on uh, basically government spending and how taxes work because we already talked about that uh, in the government uh, part of the year, I think enough to uh, to skip that just in light of how much we're trying to cram in at the end here we will talk a little bit about the national debt stuff to you know in the next lesson because uh, that's one thing I'd kind of put off to this part of the year that I feel like you need to understand a little bit what's going on with all that since it's such a topic typically um, but uh, today uh, I do want to make sure that you remember uh, one thing uh, uh, about that you would have gone over in the in, in the chapter we skipped which is the idea of uh, the progressive income tax, which is the federal income tax and, and most state income taxes, maybe all of them, are uh, based on a progressive tax code, which means that uh, a system of tax brackets that you fall into, and so uh, money that you make up to a certain amount, you know, is usually taxed at 0% because that's normally the bottom. And then anything, once you cross a certain threshold, you move into another tax bracket. And any income you make between that number and the next number is taxed at a certain rate and then anything between another threshold is another certain rate and then when you get to the top tax rate so i think the top tax rate right now is like 38 40 percent something i could be wrong um you know at, at one point back in the 50s it was as high as 90 percent. that's insane but uh so that means once you cross a certain threshold anything more extra that you make above that number will be taxed at so let's say it's 38 38 percent or whatever it is so um you know, I, I used to think I used to be under the misunderstanding that you know if you were in the thirty-eight percent tax bracket, they just took thirty-eight percent of everything. But it's kind of the it's actually based on the percentage of what you make above a certain line. So anyway, um, so today we're going to start talking about fiscal policy and the two dominant theories uh, behind fiscal policy. Um, and uh, so. Uh, fiscal policy basically is the is the government policy aimed at um, uh, aimed at affecting the economy either th by causing trying to cause expansion most often or occasionally trying to cause contraction uh, in order to stop inflation. Um, I don't know if it'll work because I think you have a mirror image of what I'm seeing, but right now it looks like I'm shredding on the guitar and it's hilarious. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry. Uh, so anyway, um, so there's a couple different ways that, that you can go about um, doing fiscal policy. There, there's So discretionary fiscal policy is where the government aims for certain goals with the intent of causing expansion or contraction. And then there are certain things that are what they call automatic stabilizers. And that those are things like public transfer payments uh, and progressive income taxes that automatically cause certain impacts on the economy if they're left alone. So, uh, for instance, the progressive income tax, which we just described, um, is going to, uh, uh, you know, mean that, uh, you know, government revenues are going to go up as uh, people are making more money. Um, public transfer payments are set up to where they're means tested in such a way that when people start to make more money, they grow out of qualifying for them and therefore... Uh, uh, things kind of go back to how they were. There's only a certain amount of impact they're going to have at, at a given time. Uh, but uh, the idea of fiscal policy is basically the idea of how the government ma is to manage the economy, which is a controversial idea from the first place, because certainly throughout the 1800s, the idea was the government just needs to stay out of it for the most part. People followed a very laissez-faire uh, view of things. Um, and then we'll look at the first of uh, the, the two schools of thought we're going to compare and contrast today, Keynesianism or demand-side uh, fiscal policy and uh, supply-side fiscal policy, also known as Reaganomics. Uh, and we'll see how those kind of competing approaches emerge in the 20th century. So so what typically are the things, so let's, before we look at the two different schools, what typically are the ways that you could cause uh economic expansion if you wanted to, to grow the economy. Uh, some of the things, uh, basically the uh, two kinds of um, things that you would want to do, and, and expansionary fiscal policy is what you would go toward if you're trying to put an end to unemployment or, or things like that. Um, so 
a couple ways you can do it. One is to increase government spending. Another is to decrease taxes. And then also to do a combination of both. And when we get to the two different schools, the supply side school is going to focus on the tax cutting. The demand school is going to focus on the, the government spending. So, um, so for instance, uh, this is an example of demand side or Keynesianism. The idea was in the Great Depression, a lot of people are out of work. So why doesn't the government cre create some new highway projects so that they can go hire some people to work? And that is money that's going into uh, that's going into the uh, economy uh, from the public uh, coffers. The other side of that is to say uh, maybe we could spur economic growth by cutting the taxes, which creates more incentive to produce because less of the money is taken. Um, and uh, maybe you might even give tax credit for, for doing certain things. And, and that is a way that you could uh, affect things. Uh, contractionary fiscal policy, which would only be done in the event that you're trying to slow down inflation, you would do the opposite of those of those things. You might um, uh, you might try to decrease government spending or increase taxes in order to put a hold of the inflation. Although that is not going to happen uh, that often. Uh, no matter what type of fiscal policy that you prefer, there's going to be a few certain problems that come along with it. One is uh, the policy lag issues. So that is a lot of times by the time that, you know, uh, the government has come up, has realized that there is a problem um, and then been able to work out a solution. Sometimes the market has already moved on and it's a little bit behind uh, the curve of, of what it really needs. Uh, and then once the policy is in place, the effects don't all necessarily happen at once. So, uh, you know, you, you pass a uh, stimulus bill that you think is going to go fix things right away. And if it's structured in a certain way, it may take six, eight months for it to make a difference. Um, so uh, sometimes if you get your fiscal policy done on kind of the wrong part, remember the previous lesson about the business cycle, right? How things go, uh, you know, up and down, peaks and troughs and contraction and, and expansion. If you do the wrong thing at the wrong time of the business cycle, you know, you can kind of make things worse. Um, so if you started to do, if you were worried about inflation and you started to do um, deflationary fiscal policy, at the same time that the market enters a downturn, like, like there could be some some serious consequences for that. Um, also, people, when they find out that a certain uh, turn of events is going down, they build their economic decisions around it, uh, and so as a result, um, you you might wind up with. Um, so, for instance, your book is an example. If they expect inflation is going to happen, they may try to spend more money now so that they don't lose purchasing power. And in doing that, they may actually cause more inflation. Uh, so, and then another issue is, uh, you know, uh, the political issue of trying to get, uh, if you're trying to come up with the right fiscal possibility, the, the, the good news and the bad news in a, in, in a Republican form of government is that you have democratic accountability. And so the good news is if they do something stupid, you can vote them out. The bad news is uh, the politicians are beholden to voters and may not want to do something that's unpopular that might actually be the right move. So it's very, very hard to get public support for um, cutting spending or raising taxes. Uh, and as a result, that's why you wind up with kind of massive uh, massive deficits all the time. Um, so there's two main schools of thought about how to handle government fiscal policy. The first kind is known as demand-side economics or Keynesianism, and it is associated with uh, the theories of a British economist from uh, the early part of the 20th century by the name of John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes uh, was the... F uh, was a major, major figure in the political discourse. He's the first person to say that some things are more important to the health of uh, the government uh, financially than having the books balanced. And so um, he was a big believer that deficit spending is not all that big of a deal. Uh, and he, he said that if in the event, he thought that it was impossible 
uh, to break out of certain recessions uh, based just on the free market. And he thought the only thing that really could kickstart it in those situations, um, and, and an example of you know, there were some moments in the Great Depression where prices were reaching equilibrium, but you still had significant amounts of unemployment. Uh, and uh, so Keynes said, you know, how do you get the way out of that? He, he thought that you couldn't without a force coming from the uh, outside and investing tons of money into the situation to change it. And, of course, he thought that the only uh, force that could do that would be the state. And uh, so in, in his case, Great Britain... Um, but the idea had a huge impact over here. And so Franklin Roosevelt, uh, the New Deal president, was uh, the first president to put uh, Keynesian economic theory into practice in the United States with the New Deal. Uh, and he was followed uh, pretty much on a bipartisan basis up until 1980 when Reagan wins the presidency. Uh, and he's going to opt for the other philosophy we'll talk about today, which is supply side economics, which some people have called Reaganomics in his honor because uh, he was the first person to really put it in place. So, uh, so in his mind, what Keynes was trying to do, he thought that the way to fix... The way to fix a busted economy is to increase the amount of aggregate demand. Create more demand for the products that are out there. And remember that demand means, in this case, means both the desire for a product and the willingness to pay for it. And that second part of that phrase is, is important to this because... Um, so what Keynes did was... Uh, he developed an equation called the spending multiplier effect, uh, which states that a small change in spending causes a much larger change in GDP, gross domestic product. Remember that measurement from a few days ago. So in his mind, uh, the total market value of consumer goods, investment goods, government goods, and net exports, remember, is, is the uh, GDP. Uh, and he believed that net exports played a small role in the economy. Uh, that government and consumer expenditures were fairly stable. He thought it was investment, uh, and this is largely quoting from your book here, he reasoned that it was investment that caused the economy to fluctuate and that investment creates a greater than one-for-one one change in the national income. So he didn't know where this investment was going to come from in the case of the Great Depression and some other situations like that. And so he said the, the state should do it because they have all this money on hand. Um, now... Uh, so the main thing he thought is the government should spend money. And so some of the ways they should spend money could be things like, uh, and in fact, we just saw this Keynesianism in action uh, to a certain extent in this corona crisis because uh, you had, um, you know, uh, this one was a little more popular with conservatives than Keynesian things usually are because it was largely, co you know, caused by government mandated shutdowns. But, uh, but you know, the idea of, uh, the economy's in a bad way, there's not enough demand, meaning uh, people's ability to pay for it in this case, uh, so what if we just gave everybody $1,200? Well, that's, that's Keynesianism in action, right? So, uh, so you give everybody $1,200, and now they've got the demand for $1,200 worth of product that they would not have had the capacity to pay for, and the thought is, you know, that those $1,200 are going out to the people, and then they're going and buying things at the store, uh, that they wouldn't have been able to buy, so the stores are making more money by doing that, and then they're able to hire more people. Uh, and, of course, I mean, the question, uh, the problem with Keynesianism that is hopefully you should already kind of see is, think about how much money we had to spend as a government uh, to give everybody basically a, a grand and some change, uh, and then think about how you know, the grand and some change is going to make, you know, we'll probably make a difference for a month or two, right? But if, if nobody, if people aren't all the way back to work in two months, you know, that $1,200 has been well burned through, uh, by anybody, especially anybody who has to, you know, feed, uh, you know, families outside of them, just themselves. So, um, you know, so, I mean, you can't really keep, uh, you know, the, the idea that you're just going to spend, dump a bunch of government money and prop up the economy that way, you can see very quickly how you're going to wind up spending an awful lot of money. And one of the problems uh, with Keynesianism in general is, you know, if you're going to, if you, you know, if you cared about at all about sort of keeping, um, you know, the debt or the deficit down at all, uh, you're going to, you know, uh, 
say if we're going to spend this much money, we would need to raise taxes with it, you would think. But uh, but everyone knows just common sense. You can't raise taxes in a recession. That's going to cut, you know, hurt demand as well because, uh, you know, as well as supply. And uh, so it creates a mess where you just get skyrocketing debt and deficit. And we'll talk about tomorrow about, so what is the actual problem with that? Um, anyway, so Keynes has this idea of government works projects. He says, well, you know, let's spend, you know, let's take some time uh, and, and, well, and let's take some money and spend it on government jobs programs, on social safety net, uh, you know, welfare checks of various description, uh, anything to just get money in people's hands. The main thing is just get money in people's hands and let the government figure out how to pay for it later. And he actually didn't really believe the debt and deficit was that harmful. Um, and of course, obviously, I don't know what he would say if he looked at the kind of debt we're running now, but that, that's, you know, kind of how he thought about, you know, the world in the 1920s and 30s. So, uh, but generally... He believed in a very activist government in a recession uh, type situation. Uh, he also thought, though, that if inflation was high, one thing about Keynes, if, if inflation was getting bad, he thought the government should use contractionary fiscal policy um, to try to slow down. He didn't want the government, the economy to grow too quickly. He thought if it grew too quickly, you'd wind up with certain inflation problems. So, uh, you have, uh, and, and again, because he was not concerned about debts, he would oftentimes call for cutting taxes and raising spending at the same time, uh, which, uh, incidentally cutting taxes and, uh, raising, uh, Spending at the same time is a great way to get a bipartisan compromise in Washington because Republicans love them some tax cuts and Democrats love them some spending increases. And when you put the two of them together, everybody can hold hands and sing kumbaya until one of these days when the deficit clock blows up and destroys the economy and everyone's going to be like, oh God, what did we do for 30 years? Uh... So how has demand side worked? Typically what has happened is the demand side has at times been able to help in short burst. However, economies that were overly dependent on demand side economics normally have wound up stagnating after a period of time. The generation, like immediately after World War II, 40s, 50s, early 60s, uh, did pretty well using, uh, at times using Keynesian uh, ideas um, you know, it was, I think Keynesianism had some impact on the, the West German economic miracle, um, although, you know, free markets had a lot to do with that as well. Uh, certainly, uh, they impacted the Great Depression. Many people believe, um, especially conservative economists, believe that the, Great, the New Deal may have actually extended the Great Depression in certain ways. Um, but we have found that, that it can kind of have an impact in, in the short run, at times have a little bit of a stimulation, uh, stimulating effect uh, on the economy. Um, in fact, uh, the end of World War II, I mean, a lot of what, uh, excuse me, the end of the Great Depression, a lot of what ended the Great Depression was the fact that with the war there, um, you know, the, go the government had to hire a whole bunch of soldiers to go fight it. Uh, and then, you know, and, and then those that stayed behind, you know, largely, who were largely were, were women or men that weren't in shape to fight anymore had to go, you know, went to work in factories making bombs and getting paid. So, you know, it greatly increased the labor pool. Um, and so, it, you know, that, that was a little bit of Keynes theory working in that case. Um, However, uh, one thing that happens, though, is that excessive aggregate demand, so if there's too much demand and not enough supply, that causes inflation. Because you've got too many dollars chasing too few products. Um, and when that happens, uh, contractionary fiscal policy requires decreases in government spending or increases in taxation. So let's say you do uh, a big stimulus bill. And... You're trying to expand the economy to maintain employment and, and that sort of stuff. Increase production, increase productivity with it. Well, uh, at some point, the demand may get too high for the supply that's there. And when that happens, uh, what you would need to do hypothetically is then pivot to 
contractionary policy to cut down on uh, the inflation, and you would want to raise taxes and cut spending at that point in time. Uh, however, in a democracy, that's not a very good recipe for getting reelected. Uh, who you know who runs on the ticket? I want to raise taxes and spend less money. Uh, not that not that many people are that committed to you know to a balanced budget, right? To to uh, to vote in favor of getting more of their money taken and fewer benefits from the government at the same time. And so what that leads to is basically the contractionary policy never materializing in the vast majority of uh, you know democratic processes. So because of that, uh, you can kind of get stuck. And if you have a situation. Uh, like what happened in the 1970s. The 1970s, America had a, a, a protracted recession, uh, a period that was known as stagflation. And they called it stagflation because the economy was stagnant and not growing, but it also had inflation, which normally, normally there's a trade-off. You know, you can say, uh, you know, normally if, if you've got economic growth, uh, and inflation is a trade-off. It's it's hard to have one without the other. But uh, we got into this weird situation where we had both at the same time. And that's a really tough deal to get out of. And for that situation, Keynesianism had no answers because anytime they would try to, you know, just pump more money into the stagflated system, it would just cause the inflation thing to get worse. Uh, and so ultimately the thing that's going to... Uh, so while Keynesianism kind of helped... According to some people, I'm a skeptic. Uh, although Keynesianism kind of helped in the Great Depression a little bit, uh, it was not able to handle the uh, financial situation of the late 1970s, which was so bad. Uh, that situation uh, would be uh, handled by uh, my hero, the sainted Ronald Reagan, coming into office uh, and installing a new economic policy built around the idea of supply-side economics. So, so what is supply-side economics? Supply-side economics is the opposite thing of, of John Maynard Keynes. The idea is instead of trying to grow the aggregate demand in the economy, you want to grow the aggregate supply, meaning make it easier for... Uh, Make it easier for producers to produce things and then let that flow down to the workers. Um, so the idea is start giving tax breaks to corporations. Start, uh, start letting businesses have more money to keep. Cor cut corporate tax rates, stuff like that. And then watch as they hire more employees. And the critics of supply-side economics like to call it trickle-down economics because the idea is, oh, you know, we'd take care of the, the rich guys and then it trickles down to, you know, everybody else. Well, the problem is it really does work like that to a great extent. Now, supply-side, uh, you know, one thing, it worked very well in the 1980s. It hadn't worked in every situation. And I, I do think, even though I'm, you know, I'm pretty conservative, I do think some Republicans kind of just overrate the magic power of uh, tax cuts, like you can just cut taxes any time and, and, and make everything magical without cutting spending. At some point, you got to do uh, do those things together. If you're going to keep cutting taxes, at some point, you got to cut spending as well. Um, but it worked very, very well in the ca in the case of uh, of the 80s, and there were some supply side oriented policy uh, tax cuts that uh, were passed a couple years ago that helped bring about some of the improvement in the economy that we had before this crisis two months ago when things were, were going really, really well. Some of that was due to a supply-side oriented tax cut policy um, that uh, President Trump signed on uh, that had, you know, McConnell and those guys had worked on. So, um, so the idea of supply-side fiscal policy is you're trying to pr provide incentives uh, for producers to increase the supply of goods. Typically, supply-side economics goes hand-in-hand -hand with deregulation. Uh, Keynesianism is all about the government really trying to manage this thing. Supply side is a lot more, you know, leave it to uh, the, you know, private actors in the private sector to figure things out. Uh, and the main thing that they are all about are um, tax cuts. 
So if the role of the government in the economy is in three categories, taxation, spending, and regulation, supply side says cut down on all three of those things or get the government less involved in all those things. Um, the main philosophy of supply side is tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts. Let people keep more of their money. If you let people keep more of their money, uh, they will spend more of their money. Uh, and if you cut, and, and they really think that cutting corporate taxes is a really important thing too, because corporations are the primary drivers of employment. And so the idea is if the corporations have more money with which uh, to expand, uh, they will be able to hire more people. And it also should be said that the supply side uh, environment of the 1980s enabled a lot of corporations to significantly step up their research and development investment in the 80s, which did a lot toward contributing to uh, a lot of the technological innovations of the 1990s that created the internet age. So there's some technological, you know, side effects that come along with that as well. Um, typically, uh, Supply siders also want the government to cut down on spending. Now, Reagan couldn't really push that part through that much because he had a Democratic Congress during much of his time. So, um, so uh, Reagan wound up uh, having to deal with some uh, spending that didn't decrease as much as he wanted to to offset those tax increases, uh, which caused the one downside of the economy in Reagan's years was a problem with the deficit, although it's nothing like the problem with the deficit that we have now by any means. Uh, but, but it was pretty bad uh, by the time. Of, but some of that was because he had to spend extraordinary amounts of money on national defense because uh, as part of his strategy of kind of stepping up the level of aggression in the Cold War, uh, which is, of course, the, you know, um, that kind of arms race that he kind of pushed the Soviet Union into. Uh, which really bankrupted the Soviet government, uh, was a major part of, you know, what kind of kicked the USSR over. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, and, the, uh, and with that, uh, uh, one thing that's really important to supply side theory is something known as the Laffer curve. Uh, and this was uh, a... Uh, curve that was in an economic model that was demonstrated by an economist by the name of Art Laffer, who was one of the fathers of this type of thinking. And the Laffer curve said that paradoxically, uh, if you cut taxes significantly enough, that you could actually increase the revenue of the government by cutting taxes. And the idea behind that is that a significant enough tax cut uh, would cause so much productivity that you could get a lower percentage of a much more productive economy and the government actually wind up with more money than if it took a higher percentage of a smaller economy. So, for instance, if... Uh, Y'all know how I take taxes in the classroom of your snack foods, right? And I just eat little pieces of it, right? Okay, let's say that... Uh, let's say that I decided to raise my tax rate to 90% of the snack food that's brought in my classroom, I'm going to eat it. So you have, you have a bag of chips, uh, and whereas now I might sneak a handful and let you finish the rest of the bag of chips. Shh, Coach Matthews, don't worry about this. Uh, <laughs> in the event uh, that I just snag a bag of, you know, a, a couple and then let you continue to eat, uh, you know, in this case, maybe I'm taking 10% of your bag of chips. But what if I said, I'm going to take almost all of your chips and like leave you a couple? Well, what's going to happen is that the bag of chip, bags of chips are going to disappear from my classroom because you're not going to be incentivized uh, uh, to bring that product uh, anywhere near me because I'm going to gobble it all up, right? So it's, it's the same way. If people uh, are, people are disincentivized to work, uh, if you have extra exorbitant tax rates, if I'm, uh, you know, if I know that I can't, that I'm going to be taxed 75%, if I, if I'm offered 10, if I'm on an hourly job and I'm offered, uh, some overtime and I know that that overtime is going to push me to another tax bracket and I'm, and I'm going to make less than that time and a half in real 
n in real numbers because that time and a half that I'm making is going to be taxed at a higher bracket and I might come home with less take-home pay than if I hadn't worked the overtime. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, sorry, I don't want to work the overtime. The problem with that is when, is when all those workers are turning down that overtime, they're not producing goods, right? So the economy, the GDP is shrinking. Uh, because, uh, you know, the boss can't find someone to do this extra work, so the extra work doesn't get done, and so some customers don't get satisfied, right? So, um, take this phenomenon and expand it. They're saying if you so incentivize people to work and, and, uh, and to create jobs, you could have an economy grow so much that we can take, um, that we can take a small percentage, uh, off, off the top for taxes and wind up with more than trying to tax, you know, 75, 80% of a much smaller economy. Does that make sense? Not that you can answer me. I, I feel like I'm supposed to say, does that make sense? Um, so, uh, if, if it really confuses you, you can send me an email, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, so this is kind of, and the thing is this actually worked in the eighties. Uh, you know, we, President Reagan passes one of the largest tax cuts or signs his name to one of the largest tax cuts in American history. It might have even been the largest. It was either his or Kennedy's in 62. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, but anyway, one of the largest tax cuts of all time specifically cut the corporate tax significantly. Um, and as a result, uh, we actually did wind up with a situation where the government made more money after the tax cut than did before because there was that much explosive growth. And the long period of time of stagflation that endured through much of the 1970s where, you know, the market cycle stayed on the negative side for a long time or the, the bad side of things for a long time and Keynesianism couldn't find a way out. Supply side economics found a way out. Now, the question is, though, um, where are you on the so-called Laffer curve? Because this, this whole government gets more money by cutting taxes trick works at a certain point. But if you take it too far, you know, if you cut the tax rates all the way down to 0% of any economy, you're going to, you're not going to make any money, right? So there, there comes to be a time where, you know, um, so the government's making more money by, raising taxes and then it reaches to a point where it starts to go down because it starts to discouraging production well depending on where you are in the curve uh this whole cut taxes to make more money trick while it sounds magical may not may not work um and it's there's really no real mechanism for knowing exactly where you are on that laffer curve which is why it hasn't always worked when people have, have tried to put i mean in general cutting taxes is good for the economy and that's just a good basic rule um but you also have to balance it against, you know, the idea of, you know, of trillion dollar deficits um, and, and what that can kind of mean for the future as well. Obviously, tax cuts are always politically popular. Obviously, government spending is always politically popular. So um, sometimes the Keynesians and the, you know, the demand and supply side people can, can like I said, kind of have a little truce where they kind of do both things and just... Uh, push the payment down to the next generation. Um, but the problem is it's at some point people have got to start working on the debt and we'll talk about that, uh, in the next go round.